city that accounts for 25% of the state's crime. If you believe network television, most cops wear sexy clothes, have more girlfriends than they know what to do with, and fire their guns at least twice a week. The truth is that police work in Boston is a day-to-day -day grind. More than quick-draw macho, the job takes patience, the ability to cope with all kinds of people, from hookers to bank presidents. And above all, the job takes street sense. There are 227 police officers assigned to Area D. Their job is to keep the peace in one of the most ethnically diverse landscapes in America. Encompassing the South End, the Back Bay, Alston and Brighton, Area D is a patchwork of humanity, where blacks and whites, Hispanics and Asians, the haves and the have-nots live side by side. In Alston, Denise Johnson begins her day by tagging cars on Mount Hood Road. After three years in Area D, she views her job as a kaleidoscope of functions. You have to care. You have to be understanding. You have to be patient. And you have to be intelligent, knowledgeable. You have to understand different ways of life, different lifestyles, different, sometimes different tongues. It's, it's a lot mixed up in one, and it takes a a special individual to maintain that kind of control. Delta K-1, we're in the area. We'll head down also. While Denise Johnson keeps an eye on one kind of traffic, in the south end, Mike Wozniak and Bobby Harrington cruise in an unmarked car looking for another kind of traffic, drug traffic. Observing what they think could be a drug deal going down, they move in to question a young man. That's, that's hash. Homemade hash. Homemade hash, huh? the good stuff. Yeah, but I'm not, uh, it's a for me for a smoke. As is often the case, instead of a drug deal, it turns out to be merely an exchange of a small amount of hashish for personal use. Feeling that the courts would toss the case out, they release the man and continue to cruise the south end. What may appear action-packed on television is, in Mike Wozni's words, Very boring. A lot of hours for a minim minimal amount of satisfaction, the only satisfaction I would say is personal satisfaction. The system works very slowly. And the so-called criminal, they know that, and they use it to their advantage. D is one of the busiest precincts in the city. Last month, there were 7,500 911 calls, 2,000 of which were priority one, the most urgent category. The majority of calls, though, are routine, many false alarms. But being a cop means always being on guard. Denise Johnson still remembers her first brush with death, accidentally stumbling into a drug transaction in progress. I went into my stance and he was already there. He already had the gun on me. And I've never been so scared in my entire life, to the point where I had to overcome my fear and yell at him. Nobody has ever put a gun on me. And I know when I came on, I said, well, it's going to happen to you eventually. But when it did happen, it, it took my guts out. It really did. I was scared. And I hope it doesn't happen anytime again too soon. But if it does, I'll be ready. Uh, the person on the right-hand side of the passenger side, the front seat, is about to have a shotgun. Statistically, most cops never fire their guns in an average 20-year career. But if the moment comes, there is little time for decision-making. Bobby Harrington once answered a call for a break-in in progress, only to discover that the would-be robber was a young child who was skipping school. He got down the cellar and uh, no light at all. And foolishly, I guess, I went down there and it took time for my eyes to get acclimated to the light. And I kept calling for the person to step forward, step forward, because my eyes started to see a shadow in the corner. And when I finally got used to the uh, darkness and the person stepped forward, it was a little girl. And, you know, it's just I had my gun out, and it, it could have easily have been that if, if she had something shining in her hand, I may have made the decision to shoot her and to shoot a little girl in her own home. Um, I don't think I'd be here talking to you today. Under arrest for what? Tony, you know what for. Were you kidding us or what? Back in the South End, the hours of cruising have paid off with an arrest. The suspect is a 22-year-old man who ran past their cruiser and down an alley the moment he spotted them. While in pursuit, Mike and Bobby noticed the suspect had tossed what they thought might be a bag of drugs into a dumpster. Their observation turned out to be correct. Fifteen dollars and fifteen bags of refund. Being a cop in 1985 means you are part optimist, part cynic. 
Many cops are fed up with lenient courts, bureaucratic red tape, and the growing threat of lawsuits. There is also frustration at having to keep a lid on a bubbling cauldron of city problems that suburbia would rather ignore. But at the same time, you must believe you are making a difference, or the job will eat you up alive. Sometimes it can be quite depressing and sad, but uh, it's a job. It's my job, and no matter how depressing it gets, or how mind-boggling it gets, it's my job, and I have to do it, and I want to do it. Of course, Andre, one of the biggest problems the Boston police have is drug trafficking. They estimate there are 12 to 14,000 heroin addicts in the city of Boston, and each of them needing to support mm -hmm. a habit, perhaps as much as $600 a day, and usually stealing to support that habit. So you can imagine that's a, a problem in and of itself. Mm -hmm. And a lot of territory to cover for them and cover it effectively. When we come back, saving the city or just doing their job. More inside Area D when Chronicle continues. judge and not being in a 209A form? It is a quiet afternoon in a fairly quiet week. An off and on rain has sent many of the players indoors. But with a forecast for clearing, everyone in this district knows that the lull can change with one phone call. Trying to keep a step ahead of the game is the responsibility of Deputy Superintendent Paul Evans. On a given day, we, you know, robbery problem, burglary problems, prostitution problems, drugs problems, and you try to address, uh, you know, put the proper focus as to, you know, where to put the resources. You know, we feel very strongly that people should be able to walk the streets. No, listen, we got we got four prisoners to go to Prince, so he's going to be with them. In an average month in Area D, Evans' staff will make 500 arrests for every crime imaginable and many you can't imagine. For this 40-hour dose of reality, a patrolman with two years' experience earns roughly $22,000. But D is a popular district, officers say, first because there's lots of action, and second because of the abundance of extra work details, which can net an officer 10 or 15,000 more a year. If you ask a dozen cops why they wanted to be police officers, you'll probably get a dozen different answers. I've always wanted to, uh, to be a police officer. I worked in another field and had a good job, but I was bored with it. I, um, so I chose to come on. It took me a lot of years to get on the job, and uh, as I said, I left a fairly good career. I really couldn't pinpoint it. I enjoy the excitement. I enjoy the adrenaline high of the job, and I especially enjoy the guys that I work with. Walter, what brought you into it? Would you, would you do it again? I'd do it again. I, I, don't, I didn't grow up wanting to be a, but, you know, a police officer. Now that I am, I, you know, I wouldn't want to switch. Officers Bobby Baird and Walter Reed drive the Nova 112, a rapid response unit. Baird and Reed have just received a call that a bank holdup is in progress. 112's Adam Robert. All right, sir. Nova 112, you can slow it down. There's nothing showing here. As occurs 99% of the time, the call turns out to be a false alarm, a teller tripping the switch by mistake. It is this constant pressure to go from zero to 60 to pump up and then simmer down that makes police work so stressful. While many enjoy the rush, most hope their children choose a saner profession. Would you want your kid to be a cop? Uh, I don't have any kids right now, but if I do have them, no. Why not? Walter may be a little better at that. He's got kids now. Why? I, the job wasn't really what I expected it to be. I think I was kind of the, one of those people who had the impression that you would be going out with guns blazing and, you know, saving the city. Uh, I realize it's a lot more to the job than that. How many kids do you have, Walter? Three. Would you want your kid to be a cop? No. no I don't think so. I think we'll uh, see if we can get them at the school and <laughs> something a little different anyway. It is now late afternoon, and the guard is once again changing for the evening shift. 
In the lobby of the station, a homeless man trying to escape the cold catches a nap on the floor. At the desk, the mood is relaxed. That will be short-lived. There's a certain rhythm to life in Area D. It varies with the journey of the sun across the Boston skyline. When day turns to night, Boston puts on a different face. And oftentimes, it's not a pretty one. It doesn't take long for the evening's first arrest. At 7 p.m., a suspect is apprehended, accused of robbing a woman of her pocketbook in the lobby of an apartment building. Probably, what is he in for? I think it's a robbery of accounting. I'm not sure. Nighttime is when most of the serious players come out. It is also the time when most violent crimes occur. The street muggings and armed robberies. Add to that the college bar scene in the back bay in Brighton. And you'll see why Knight Commander Lieutenant John Ciccolo says we don't suffer from boredom. You can see anything from murder, robberies, rapes, whatever. Uh, that's the uh, reason most of the policemen are here. They're well motivated, and it's an interesting place to work. If you're uh, half alive, this is the place to be. A couple of changes up in the personnel at Area D. Let's see, Deputy Superintendent Paul Evans was promoted to Superintendent of the Bureau of Field Services. That went into effect a couple of weeks ago. And James Claiborne is now the new Deputy Superintendent. I'm glad to see they're all doing well there. Yeah. Next, the quiet night starts to heat up when Chronicle continues. Stay with us. Time is the time when calls quicken along with the pulse of the city, and the element of danger increases as the hours go by. You gentlemen have an identification? What's your name? What is it? Where are you from, Mike? Oh, you were born on Pine Street? Where are you from, Mike? When you drive an unmarked patrol car at night, there are two things you value more than anything, your partner and your gun. A gun is to a police officer what a security blanket is to a baby. Where it goes, you go. Your partner is your alter ego, your friend, your protector. Paul Mahoney and Bill McCarthy have been together for 11 years. Probably a little bit better than a marriage because you can walk away from each other when you get upset. Um, I think it's wise because I know exactly how Paul's going to react in a given situation and I don't have to look over my shoulder to see what he's doing because I know what he's doing. And the same with me. I'll be doing something and Paul's going to know exactly what I'm doing. Alright, so 4 9, uh, would you take 336 Beacon Street? This is in the rear, there should be a stolen 76 almost. Being a cop in 1985 is at best a balancing act. Facing the worst that life can dish out, you must possess a special ability to be rock tough one minute and compassionate the next. Peter Jerome drives the Delta 409, a service car in the back bay. He is answering a call from a man who claims his co-worker has stolen his car. My wife's car. <laughs> we had to take places checked out. They drive him with the cash plate. Oh, is it, is it a different place, huh? Yeah. Have you got the number? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, if you spend a week riding with the Boston police, you begin to understand why many cops feel they are merely treading water. Last year in the city, there were 24,000 larcenies, 11,000 burglaries, and 82 murders. When you ask most cops what their biggest gripe with the system is, a majority give you the same answer, a nagging feeling that too often the courts let them down. I don't think that the police uh, can serve the public today as effectively as they could 20 years ago. Uh, there's problems with, uh, with the penal system. Uh, life doesn't mean life. Life is only a certain number of years. Uh, a certain number of years turns out to be an indefinite sentence or something, uh, and they're out a uh, much shorter period of time. I went through the light because uh, I have all the other cars have been waiting there for a long time. The guy who was in front of me pulled out. Uh, he didn't go. You were the only one that went. I know. Well, I figured, you know, he was going to go. Plus, you come down Commonwealth Avenue pretty quick on a motorcycle, too. Can I see your driver's license for a moment? It is 11 o'clock on a Friday evening, and things in Boston are beginning to heat up. While Peter Jerome pulls over a motorcyclist for running a red light, in the South End, John Gallagher and Bill Carroll in the Nova 111 respond to a holdup. 
two New Hampshire men who had stopped on Northampton Street to ask directions to the combat zone were relieved of $260. One of the men is furious and wants to go after the robbers. Calm down. I know. I know. Look at. I know you're upset. Just calm down. Two hundred. Where did it happen? On the corner. We're asking directions. Son of a bitch, go to give us directions. What they do? Surround the car? No, just two of them. Two of them. And all I see was one in there. Son of a bitch, give me what you got. Took off down right into that crowd. Did he have a weapon? Right no, just, just there was too many. I didn't lock. I didn't run. No. I don't even know where I am. I mean, did you hand over your money to him without a weapon being shown? Chief. I'd have given me my life right here. Well, what did he do to you to, to scare you into giving you the Give money? me what you got right now. And you didn't drive off? After a protracted discussion, Gallagher and Carroll convinced the victim that risking his own life to recover the money isn't worth it. There's just so many different things that can happen, and you, you, you treat each one different, so you have to be able to adapt to be able to do that real quick, you know. You've got to be able to control the situation. I think adaptability is important, but I think that... Uh, it's important not to lose a humanitarian view of life where you're always confronted with the bad side of things. It's important to maintain a positive image about people and try to uh, uh, maintain a caring attitude. From one mugging, Gallagher and Carroll move on to another. This time, it's over to Huntington Avenue, where two men have been accosted by a small band of juveniles brandishing knives. I'm defending my friend with a, with a drywall knife. We're kicking people. We're standing in the middle of the street. Did anyone lose any property? No, thank God. I mean, I don't even know what happened. I ran the Huskies, and none of these morons and fucking Huskies supposed to be hu not decent football players. Did any, my... any of them have a weapon? Good knives. All right. And so it continues, a night that will include a few cold swigs of coffee and barely enough time to wolf down a sandwich. At times, Area D feels like a battle zone, a street war where the bad guys often win. But for those who patrol this district 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, it's been just another week at the office. There's so many different...